culture is ruining comedy. Chances are you've probably heard somebody say this or read it online, even if you aren't a comedian. Google defines political correctness as the avoidance, often considered as taken to the extreme, of expression or action that it is perceived to exclude, marginalize, or insult individuals or groups of people who are socially disadvantaged or discriminated against. Uh, Urban Dictionary defines PC <laughs> political correctness as the death of comedy. <laughs> so that's where I come in. As a stand-up comedian, I'm always interested in the conversation around comedy's place in society and culture because comedy has a fascinatingly unique place in the zeitgeist, specifically because comedy is the one form of speech that, for the most part, is considered excluded from the same social conventions and contracts that other forms of speech are. Now, <sighs> Whenever it comes to political correctness, political correctness feels at odds with comedy because whenever it comes to comedians' abilities to speak freely, that's got kind of a rocky precedent that's already set for it. I won't bore you with a full history of stand-up comedy, but knowing some of its roots and some historical precedent helps frame why the idea of political correctness feels at odds with comedy. Uh, Stand-up comedy in the United States finds its earliest roots in the stump speech of early 19th century minstrel shows. Uh, in these shows, performers would deliver unaccompanied comedic monologue in blackface, and that monologue would convict, con oh, and that monologue would be comprised of malapropisms, puns, and flat-out nonsense delivered in a parodied version of black vernacular English. So not the most progressive start, to say the least. Uh, but then at the turn of the 20th century, it evolved again. Comedians began incorporating into their act lewd innuendo and a variety of other ethnic personas that were based on popular stereotypes at the time. Then the boundaries shifted again in the 1950s and 60s and expanded to include more conversations on politics, race relations, and more direct sexual humor that more closely mirrors what modern stand-up comedy is. Then, comedians started getting arrested for what they were saying on stage. From 1961 to 1964, Lenny Bruce was arrested four times for violating obscenity laws. In New York in 1964, he was actually convicted of violating an obscenity law, and he was sentenced to working four months in a workhouse. Now, during the appeals process, Bruce was released on bail, but ultimately died before the appeals decision was made and was ultimately pardoned posthumously, but not until 2003. Then, in 1972, George Carlin was arrested in Milwaukee for performing his bit that would ultimately become to know, uh, come to be known as seven words you can never say on television. So hearing all of that summed up like that, a lot of it sounds like pretty aggressive censorship and possibly violations of freedom of speech that's protected underneath the First Amendment. I think that political correctness feels at odds with comedy because people are treating it similarly to censorship and freedom of speech violations when it's an inherently different conversation in and of itself. Because whenever it comes to stand-up comedy, there are two things that make me pause whenever it comes to political correctness and its role in comedy. The first is that one of the tenets of comedy is the introduction of a new or unusual perspective on an idea or subject matter. Chances are, at some point during the course of your life, you've heard a joke that after you heard it, you were like, huh, I never thought about it that way. That's, that's pretty funny, right? Chances are you're thinking of a very specific joke right now. Stand-up comedy, Stand-up comedy, even if the subject matter is irreverent, thrives on making people look at thoughts and ideas through a new lens, which leads into my second concern, is the exposure of new thoughts and ideas through mass media. 
There's no denying that introducing a new idea through mass media gives it power, but there's no way to guarantee that that impact is going to be a positive impact. Sometimes mass media can shine a light on something heinous that's going on in the shadows, and it can bring justice to something that's going on. Once the Me Too movement was exposed to mass media, we started a national conversation about how people in power were using that power in Hollywood and other industries to sexually coerce and abuse people. And we're seeing people arrested and brought to justice from that empowerment. Then, on the other side, sometimes shining a light on something heinous through mass media can draw more supporters to something that's unjust or heinous, like what people are calling the neo-Nazism revitaliz revitalization that we're seeing in certain cultures where white men are feeling disenfranchised by all of these conversations that are happening and they're coalescing and gathering and protesting and it's exploding and erupting in violence and in some cases murder like what we've seen in Charlottesville, Virginia. And stand-up comedy is going through one of those mass media booms right now. That's why Netflix is releasing 24,000 stand-up comedy specials every 40 minutes, and that's only barely an exaggeration. <laughs> As stand-up comedy finds its place further propelled through mass media, people are going to have to be more thoughtful and mindful of the impact of the things that they are saying and how that impacts other people's lives. Take Kevin Hart, for instance. He lost his job hosting the 2019 Oscars because of homophobic tweets that he tweeted online back in 2012. One of those tweets, uh, Hart wrote that if his son ever came home and tried to play with his daughter's dollhouse, he would smash the dollhouse over his son's head and say, stop, that's gay. Didn't hear a laugh in the room because it's not a joke. There's no setup, there's no punchline, there's nothing to indicate that there's anything jokey about it. What that is, that's a comment that implies that a father would hurt his son. That's a comment that implies that a father's love is conditional and that that's okay. That is a comment that implies that violence is okay when it's being directed towards queer people. But because Kevin Hart is funny, a large segment of the population was willing to push all of those concerns aside and say, but I want him to host, he's so funny. Think about it in a non-comedy context. If Dan from accounting at your job walked up to you while you were getting coffee in the break room, tapped you on the shoulder and said, hey, you know, if my son ever played with a dollhouse, I'd break it on his head and tell him, stop, he's being gay. Anyway, that report's due Friday, and then walked away, you'd be like, uh, we might need to have a conversation about Dan, right? Like, should we tell HR? Like, you would be alarmed by that. And the thing is, is that it's a lot easier to conceptualize why Dan from accounting should lose his job, right? Because when you think about it, if somebody's going around work saying things that are homophobic, making people uncomfortable, there are laws and rules and regulations and policies that tell Dan if you do that, you don't get to have a job anymore. When it comes to stand-up comedy, those regulations aren't there. There's nothing to stop people from doing things and saying things that make people feel uncomfortable and unsafe. And think about the difference of the impact between those two things. Dan at work is going to be making 10, 25, 50, maybe 100 people uncomfortable at work if he's really good at being homophobic. Kevin Hart has a platform of millions. He has national, international exposure to where if he is saying something that makes people feel uncomfortable or unsafe, he is having a much bigger impact than Dan from accounting. So where is the difference? 
Why is him losing the job hosting the Oscars considered unjust, but it's a lot easier to think about Dan losing his job? And that, I think, is the key difference between censorship, freedom of speech violations, and political correctness, because it's the method of enforcement. Censorship is enforced by a federal agency. The police that arrested Bruce and Carlin, those were state or local agencies. The people advocating for political correctness are individuals or groups of people who have reached their threshold for tolerance and are saying no more. Before, People who were in disenfranchised groups were just a couple of people in cities, towns, communities who didn't have the numbers to be able to speak up and tell people, I'm uncomfortable and don't feel safe around you all the time. But with the explosion of technology that we've seen over the past 20 years, we, we've gone from being a few people in a community to a community of millions on a global scale who are speaking out about bad behavior and saying this is how the ignorant or malicious things that you are saying are impacting me and my experience going through the world. But for whatever reason, when it comes to stand-up comedy, they get an exclusion. You, you get an exclusion just because you're a comedian, and it doesn't make sense. Anyone, not just a comedian, but anyone who has a massive platform to share their ideas cannot absolve themselves of being expected to handle their platform responsibly. Whenever it comes to comedy, freedom of speech is important. When it comes to comedy, keeping censorship reasonable is very important. Political correctness doesn't have to be important to you, and that's okay, but it might be important to your audience, and the audience is what makes a comedian's career. And at the end of the day, the voices that rise to the top are going to be those voices who are finding ways to include everyone. It's not going to be the voices that are on stage trying to blame a bad show on the other 500 people in a room. You can write a joke about offensive subject matter. If you want to think about political correctness as this burden and that comedians are supposed to be able to cross lines, try considering political correctness as a ton of new lines for comedians to cross. Any good writer would find a way of writing jokes that can challenge those lines but aren't necessarily going to have a negative impact on somebody else's experience because that's what every good comedian is at the end of the day. They are a writer. And well-written jokes can cover offensive subject matter in a thoughtful way, but offensive subject matter doesn't make a joke well-written. Thank you.